want to be a journalist. Uh, I was prompted to this partly by John Gunther. Well, Washington was a, the kind of place where you could have lunch at the press club and meet uh, almost everybody who knew something about it. Right. And uh, I, and I followed that very assiduously. Also, I was I was fascinated by Roosevelt. He was a giant, right. even then. Right. And he was first imprinted upon my personality in Ely, Minnesota, during the Depression, when the banks failed, and there were people don't realize now what the hell it was. They have what five million unemployed in the country, and uh, the country was about to crash. And Roosevelt came along with this jaunty way of his. And he, he saved the whole goddamn thing. And then when I came to Washington, I discovered that Roosevelt's White House staff was about eight or nine. Right. He pulled us through the Depression and, and the war with a staff no bigger than 10 or 15. Look what the hell it is now, hundreds all over the city bump, sure. bumping into themselves. And, uh, and Roosevelt, to me, was a, uh, well, let's say, he, I knew how major a figure he was. Mm -hmm. He just showed it. You know, he had these, he would have, I'll rely on my notes, he would have uh, two press conferences a week, one for the mornings and one for the afternoons. Uh, and they would crowd into this office of his, and he would sit there, you know, smoking a cigarette and, uh, and take the questions. Truman was uh, electioneering in Los Angeles when I was working for Newsweek, and uh, he, we had a press, he had a press conference at 8 in the morning, and everybody was sort of sleepy and they weren't coming up with questions. I remember Truman said, what's the matter, boys, running out of soap? <laughs> well, that was, that was, Truman it was a, had a way of saying things vulgarly that Roosevelt was elegant with. You know, his group of 12, uh, during that period of time, one of them was Robert Jackson. That's right. And yeah. he was there as a, a solicitor general, attorney well, general. Well, you know, Robert Jackson, who people have a memory, he may not have been a giant, but compared to the people who have succeeded him, he was. Right. And uh, I never, I think I was at a press conference or something once or twice, but I never had much contact with him because that wasn't my job. Right. And, uh, but you know, he was one of the key people around, about Roosevelt, and I was fascinated by his role in the Nuremberg trial, right. just because I was interested in it. Uh, I was at Nuremberg a very short time. I was there between assignments, and I wasn't there long enough. I was there long enough to get to know all the correspondence, mm -hmm. but not to know the substance of the trial. Right. Uh, Correspondents are clubby, you know, they, they, they feed on each other, and you get to know them all, and that was an interesting group. Do uh, you remember some of the people who you, uh, some of your well, colleagues? Steve Laird of Time Magazine. I was fascinated by the Nuremberg trials, but that wasn't my job. Exactly. I, I was doing various things in Germany. I was in the Berlin Bureau of Time. Well, tell me about Rebecca Wester, because she, you know, was one of the foremost reporters at the Nuremberg trial. That's right. The first one. Yeah, yeah, and she wrote a good book about it. And, and uh, how, did your paths cross with hers? Were you no, uh, no, a wonderful no. observer? No, our paths never crossed, unhappily. I know all about her and read everything about her. And I have, in, the, in my study in the other room, I have 10 books by her about Rebecca West. No, and, no and she was a great lady. You see, I had very little connection with Nuremberg. I, I know all about Jackson, and I admired him because of what I knew about him in what Washington. Did, what did you know about him at that time? As you know, you're in, in Europe at the time, and all of a sudden, Jackson... Uh, well, he was one of, you know, Roosevelt couldn't have done what he did without a half a dozen great people around him, and he was one of them. Right. And he, he shone and he had stature. You know, when he walked into a room, you knew that this was a man in charge and he was to be taken seriously. And everything he said or did made a lot of sense, if you were a Democrat, right. which I was. And uh, we went through the Depression in Dealey, Minnesota. And my mother, you know, when everything crashed, she said, thank God we have Roosevelt in Washington. So this was imprinted on my mind. Very, very early. Uh, I wrote a, a couple of interesting pieces for Stripes. 
of lesser trials for war criminals. Right, right. And they made a little bit of a splash. But I was never assigned to Nuremberg, and I followed it, but didn't know very much about it. Did your paths ever cross with either Alan Dreyfus or Norbert Ehrenfreund? Alan Dreyfus is one of my closest friends. Is that right? Oh, yeah, yeah. We were together. He was on stripes for a while, I think. Right. And, uh, and he had this lovely Czech wife, Czech by descent, and, uh, and I saw a lot of them while we were in Europe, and then we, they visited me here in Washington. And uh, when, when you first called me on this thing, I kept thinking, what the hell was the name of my friend who was in D Detroit who was at the Nuremberg trials? That was Ellen. Yeah. And I had a lovely Christmas card from him, as usual. Over there during it in Berlin, did your paths cross with the, um, whether the young, some of the younger, now more known uh, correspondents, whether it was Edward R. Murrow or whether it was Walter Cronkite or Richard Hodlett or any, any of that group in your paths? You're getting on to something. That'll take an extra half hour. I'm here. <laughs> okay. Hodlett was. Well, I know, first of all, I know all those CBS guys. Right. And uh, I know Merle uh, best of all in a way because uh, when I was at this air base in southern England, I, um, I phoned Merle and said, why don't you come here and do some hometowners on this interesting group? They're all fighter pilots. Fighter pilots are different, and which they are and were. and. Uh, he said, I'll put it on my schedule, and he showed up there. And he interviewed all these guys, and of course, that one, and the, uh, everything was audio then. There was no, no film. Right. And uh, he, did, he did a number of broadcasts about these guys, and of course, that, that's in my popularity in the, in the base skyrocketing. But uh, <coughs> Murr was in London. And I would go up there occasionally whenever I went to London. I would look in on them. We developed, we developed a you know, conversational friendship. In a nutshell, what it adds up to is that Murrow had the good sense when he created this. Well, he didn't create the networks. He found himself having to make broadcasts at the start of the war when he was in, the, in, in Europe on an educational mission of some kind. That was his business and trade at that time. Sure. And, uh, and he, you know, he did one or two experimental broadcasts that were great. And they said, well, look, we need the same, now that goddamn war's on, we need the same from here, there, and there. And he remembered colleagues uh, whom he knew, or he knew of them with their reputation, and he called them up and said, look, this is fast overnight, but I need you to broadcast tomorrow about, the, about this goddamn war. And they all responded. It became CBS News. I'll be darned. And uh, Hodlett, I got to know all these guys very well. Uh, Hodlett was very, very good, but a cold fish mm -hmm. in contrast to the others. Uh, his colleagues who didn't particularly like, like him said it was the German part of his heritage. Right. And, uh, but I got along very well with, uh, with Hodlett. Uh, Alex Kendrick became my closest friend. Uh, and he wound up in Vienna for CBS after the war, and we were colleagues for years. And when he retired, finally, I would go up to Philadelphia and visit him every two weeks until he died. And these were men of such extraordinary substance that you can't even compare them with the bums running around today with right. big names. Right. And uh, let's see, who are the others that you mentioned? Howard K. Smith. Howard K. Smith was a great gentleman. And he just had marvelous quality as a person. And I ran into him once in, uh, I was covering the uh, Italian first post-war elections, which, at which the communists might win. And I was in uh, Milan. And we were lunching. And uh, I said, uh, your man in Vienna, I don't know whether it's Kendrick or whoever, that his, uh, is, uh, is, going, is going back to the States, and uh, what are you going to do for a fill-in? And Howard said, what about you? I, I said, I've never broadcasted. 
And he said, well, you can, you will. And so I became CBS in Vienna. And I did that, I did that for about a year. And then another year after that, I did it for NBC. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got onto the hang of that very quickly. It's a very effective way of conveying news. And, uh, but Kendrick was my model. <laughs> Kendrick would get New York, you know, in those days you went down to RCA Communications and you logged in to get 15 minutes of, of airtime and so on, and then you either spoke or read. Mm -hmm. And Kendrick, they would call him up and give him 15 minutes and he would talk in a monologue with everything organized. It was a great, great skill and I was in awe of it. But Kendrick was one of those sturdy people who, you know, I, I was ready to emulate, and emulate him in every way. His values were so great and his ability to handle news and so on. They were all extraordinary men of the like. You know, if you looked around the news business today, you wouldn't find anybody quite like them. Right. The most important thing is they were grounded in newsrooms. They learned about news writing for newspapers. Mm -hmm. and. In other words, they, they knew about news in depth without having to call it that. Right. And uh, uh, <clears throat> the chief thing to distinguish these people who are, are doing news today is that they're all products, they're almost all products of radio or television. Uh, the last one to, to work in, in, in a newspaper, I think, was uh, Brokaw. Brokaw, yeah. Brokaw. Brokaw, yeah. The bus is me, and it was made in Budapest. 